This is lecture six, part one, and we will start something that's completely new. Well, again, and the name is called decision tree. And let's start with a simple real life example, maybe. And let me load this image. So the thing that we are trying to classify is suppose I see someone on campus and should I say hi or not? So maybe let's just use this as an example. So suppose I meet, meet one of my students on campus, should I say hi? And the first question here is, do you remember the person's name? So I don't remember most of my students' names. So maybe I'll say no here, that's likely the case. And is there time to flee? Well, if I see that person, that person probably sees me as well, so probably no time to flee. And could you pretend to get a call on your cell phone? Uh, I usually don't have my phone in my hand when I'm on campus, so maybe not, let's say no. And are you wearing sunglasses? No, I never wear sunglasses. So no, and so the suggestion is address the person using some amusing nickname. Well, that's actually not what I do usually. So if I see someone that I recognize, I'll probably ask like you were in my CS540 or something like that. But well, Anyways, we should consider another example, say you. So suppose you see me on campus, then you probably, the first question is probably yes, you know my name, hopefully. And um, next is, am I an ex? Uh, no, I don't have an ex who is my student. So no, a friend's ex. Um, Hopefully, no. Hopefully, my ex is not your friend. But anyways, let's say no again. Small probability event. And am I an enemy or a frenemy? Well, it depends. If I failed you in the course, then, well, probably I am an enemy. So let's start with that assumption. So I say I gave you an F. And, and then yes. And the question is asking is, are you in a convertible with Brad Pitt and or Rihanna? Mm -hmm. I would say no, actually. Most likely it's not happening. And so, okay, so the answer is don't say hi. So basically, if I failed you, then you're not going to say hi. That's kind of reasonable. Let's try the other route. If I say give you A, then I'm hopefully your friend. And uh, then the question is, are you robbing a bank? Well, hopefully no. And uh, are you in a bathrobe on campus? Well, I will say no again. And then you will say hi. So. So basically, the key decision here is, is basically whether I gave you F or A. But well, we, we can basically reach a decision that says say hi and reach a decision that says don't say hi. So it seems kind of reasonable to have a tree like this. So when you are making daily life decisions, you want your algorithm to be something like this. So imagine if you use some other algorithm, like you train some weights, like they are numbers, and then you have your answers to, to, to these questions as your features. Say, do you remember the name? It can be 0 or 1. Let's say that's feature 1. And is there time to flee? It's feature 2, 0 or 1. So you have a bunch of 0 1s, and then you have like lots and lots of weights. And then are you going to compute something like and also an activation function, whether it's larger than 0 0.5 or not, right? So in real life, we don't want 
decision rules like this because they don't make sense. I'm not going to remember a bunch of numbers and then given the features, I'm going to just compute the activation and, and hopefully it, it makes a good decision for me. Um, so these things are harder to explain. So they may be better than a tree because the tree may, be, may, may not capture all the information. Uh, however, they are difficult to explain to yourself and also to someone else. So suppose you are a doctor and you want to explain to a patient what's happening and you are going to give the patient like a bunch of numbers like weights and then tell, tell the patient that you activated these weights and then you get this number and the patient will understand nothing, right? So, <laughs> so, so basically for the sake of being able to explain stuff, we may want to train a structure based on the features which are like the answers to these questions. Based on these, we create a tree and then these will be easier to explain. So that's one reason. And the uh, other reason why we want a tree is we can also separate the features that are important and the features that are not important. So usually the things on the top of the tree or near the root of the tree, there are more important features. That would be why we're asking these questions first. We're not going to ask something like, are you robbing a bank at the beginning? I mean, at, at the root of the tree, right? So we are going to ask something that's more informative at the beginning. So, so these are the two good properties of training a tree instead of training some mathematical classifier. And this is what we're going to do this time. And before I talk about how to actually train it, I'm going to talk about what the classification boundary is. So remember, we had classification boundary that are lines. So this would be a perceptron. And then we have lots and lots of perceptrons stacked together to make a network. And a network decision boundary can be basically anything you want. So that would be a neural network. And then we talked about support vector machines, which go. we're back at the, the lines or the hyperplanes. And then we have that kernel SVM stuff. And then it becomes like whatever shape you want again. So, well, you can guess. This time we're going to do the same. We're going to have trees, which, so decision tree here, which will be basically lines as decision boundaries. Let me maybe give an example. So suppose there are feature one and feature two. Then, then at the root of the tree, suppose the feature we're using is x2. Then we want to, to decide whether x2 is above some threshold like 0 0.5 or below. And then after we make the decision, then we'll say we want to decide whether x1 is below or above some other threshold, say 0 0.2. And we can have a different one here, say 0 0.8. So we will have a classification boundary like this. So say these ones are using the same example as last time, arts, and these are, say, trash cans. Right? So we will have some kind of linear decision boundary, and we are going to call these things axis-aligned decision boundaries because they are parallel to the feature axis. And of course, we're going to create lots and lots of trees. And the good news is there is a word for lots of trees. It's called forest. And we add a random in front. A random forest is basically the, the lots of lots of trees combined version. And it can create like arbitrary decision boundaries like this. So in part one, we'll talk about how to train a decision tree. And then in part two, we'll talk about how to combine them to make these a forest. OK, so let's get started. Um, the algorithm is actually surprisingly simple. So it's just as what I explained before. The idea is we find the feature that's most informative, and then we split the training set so that there are subsets, and each subset we build a tree 
based on that subset. So we are basically doing this recursively. And the only thing that is not clear at the moment is what do I mean by this informativeness? So we need a definition for informative, and then we're done, right? We're just recursively splitting according to the most informative feature. So the thing to measure informativeness is called entropy. It's slightly different from the entropy from physics. And somehow they are related, but I'm not familiar with the definition in physics, so I'm not going to talk about the relationship. Uh, so here in statistics, entropy is the measurement of uncertainty. So how is uncertainty related to information? So here, if you know the value of something that's uncertain, then knowing it is more informative. And so if you think about the opposite, if you know something for sure, then I don't really need to know the value. Knowing the value will not be that informative. It will, contain, will not contain a lot of information. So for example, a real life example would be uh, so suppose I want to know if a movie is good or not, then if I know it's a movie by Christopher Nolan, then I'm like I'm very sure that it's going to be good. So if you give me a trailer, then the trailer will not be informative of whether it's good or not because I know for sure it's already very good. But if you give me a movie made by someone that I don't know, then I need a trailer. A trailer will be very informative of w whether the movie will be good or not. So, because it's, it reduces uncertainty by knowing the value of that variable. So that would be the relationship. So more informative things are, say, more uncertain, and they would have a higher entropy. So the, the mathematical de definition of entropy is given by this. And uh, uh, it seems it's difficult to understand something like this, so we should use some examples. So say P0, P1, and let's say our entropy. Entropy should be H. And uh, so the first example is if I'm 100% sure, it's P0. So here, the example is that there's P0 probability, it's class 0, and 1 minus P0, which is P1 probability, is class 1. So if it's 100% class 0, then we have P0 is 1, and P1 is 0. If you substitute these numbers in, this is 1 times log of 1, which is log of 1 is 0, and 0 times something is 0 as well, so so 0. If you do the other thing, so if it's 100% class 1, then this is also 0 because the formula seems symmetric. And if you look at half and half, then half times log 2 of 2, which is 1, and this is also half times 1, so half plus half is 1. So our entropy is actually the largest when it's the most uncertain. So these two cases, we are certain of the class. This is the most uncertain. So if you actually plot this for different values of P0 or P1 symmetric, then you get a graph like this. So it's the maximized at half, exactly half. Uh, so it turns out if we have a requirement like this, so the m most uniform variable ha has the highest entropy and the most certain ones have the lowest uncertainty and we add some other technical assumptions like if we add two independent variables, we can add up the entropy or something like that. Suppose we have all those requirements. It turns out that this formula is the only mathematical formula that can satisfy all of those properties. And that is why we are using a formula like this. And I, I know that there are some kind of physical 
<laughs> definition from physics that actually says why log two and one over this measures the number of bits that is contained in some random variable, but I'm not really sure how to explain that. So I'm going to stick with this as a, a, a one of the possible functions and actually turns out to be the only one that satisfy the property that we want that kind of measures uncertainty. Okay, so this is exactly what I talked about. So I'll skip that slide. And we had the two class example. So now suppose we extend it to k classes. It's basically the same. So it's just probability of fraction times log time, log of the fraction. And we sum them up and put a minus sign in front because it's one over. OK, so the next thing is called conditional entropy. So it's still an entropy. The only difference is we know some feature value x. And then given this value, what would be the entropy of y? That's basically the question to ask. So suppose x is some specific value x. So I'll say x can be 0, 1, or 2. And then for each specific x, we can compute the fraction of y Given this value is, say, the particular uh, particular value is 0, how, what is the fraction of y that's class 0, what's the fraction that's class 1, and so on. And then we basically use the same formula, just the fraction log fraction, and we sum it up. So it's basically just the same thing. We're just con conditioning on a feature being, on a feature having a specific value. And then if we take the weighted average of those things, we get the conditional entropy. This is called the conditional entropy of the label given the feature. Yes, so the first one is the conditional entropy of the label given a specific value of the feature, and this will be the general conditional entropy. And also, we talked about cross entropy before, and now I guess you know why the name is called cross entropy. And cross entropy, actually, if you look at the formula, it is like the same. So it's just the fraction or probability times log of the probability. The only difference is cross entropy. So these two fractions are for different variables. One is for y, and the other one is for x. So the formula that you remember is this. It's something log something. Um, know that these entropies would measure the uncertainty. So if relative to the activation, if this actual label is certain, then it means they are related in a good way. So given the other one, relative to the other one, this is certain. If relative to the to, to our labels, the, the actual label, the actual class is still uncertain, so we still don't know anything, then it's not good. So we don't want the uncertainty to be high. We don't want this entropy to be a high number, so that is, that is why we want to minimize the entropy. So remember when we have entropy as a loss function, we're always minimizing it. So we're not maximizing the uncertainty. OK, that's an aside. It's not related to what we are talking about here. And let's get back. And the important thing now here is information gain. So information gain is basically how much you gain from conditioning on this feature x. So here, it may seem strange that we are taking the difference between the entropy of y subtracted by the entropy of y given x. So you may think we should flip the, these. And I thought like this in the beginning as well, but it, it turns out the formula is correct here. So the way to think about this is, again, this measures uncertain uncertainty. So if this is small, it means it's more certain, right? So given x, 
I'm more sure about what, what Y is, then it means the X is good. Right? So if we know X and then we are we also know Y, then it means X is a good predictor of Y. And when it is certain, know that entropy is zero when we are certain. So entropy in general is smaller when we are more certain about something. So when this term is smaller, the information gain is larger. So it's still consistent. Information gain is larger when we have a good predictor, which is summarized in this sentence. So this is exactly what we want. So we want to find the X that maximizes the information gain. And that's what will happen in the next slide. So we basically, what we do now is we compute the information gain based on all features and find the one that maximizes it maximize this information gain, and then we split according to that feature xj. So basically, we split according to the most informative feature. And what I mean by splitting is, so suppose that that feature is 1, so we group the instances with instance j being 1, that's group 1, and instance j being 2, that's group 2, and so on. So you immediately know the problem. If X is like continuous, how do we make it like multiple groups? So here it's for the discrete features. And if we have continuous features, there are many ways to deal with this. So the simplest way is, of course, you can just arbitrarily split it into multiple categories. So for example, if you have a continuous feature, you can split like 0 to 1 is the first category, 1 to 2 is the second category, 2 to 3 is kind of third category. It maybe it makes sense, maybe, maybe it does not. Uh, but a m more, say, popular way to do it is always only consider binary splits. So basically, you s split according to a threshold. And one very simplistic way to do this is just I can split according to the f f first instance, the first feature J value of the first instance, and then we can split according to this, the feature J value of the second instance, and so on. So we basically try all the possible splits, and we find the one with the highest information gain. So that's actually what you will do for P2. So you can just try all possible splits, and what I mean by possible is it's it's one of the points in the tra in the training set, and that seems to take a long time and it seems inefficient. So in practice, there is a more efficient way, but you don't have to implement it. If you want to implement it, it's okay actually for P2 as well. So actually, let me talk about this. So in practice, a more efficient way is to 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 sort the training set. Uh, according to this feature, and we split according to midpoints. So I think the formulas here, they're not clear, so let me explain it using a diagram. And suppose we have like a bunch of class zero, and I mean, let's still use cross and circles. Say we have a structure like this. Then, previous method would say, I can try to split here, I can try to split here, and here, and so on. The problem is, why are we splitting here? Splitting here, like on, on, the, on the left side, we're certain, on the right side, we're uncertain, but if we move and split here, on the left, left side, we are still certain, and it turns out on the right side, we become more certain as well. So, so it's never good to split at some places that, that such that con consecutive instances have the same label. So if they have the same label, we never want to split anywhere here. And also, we do not want to split in between these two instances. So we're going to pick this one and this one, pick its midpoint, and 
and, and choose this as a possible split or possible threshold to split. And we can, of course, split here, and we can split here. So there are three possible splits, and then we just find the one with maximum information gain. Okay, so that's the more practical and efficient way to do this. But of course, if you try all the possible ways to split, you'll get the same threshold. Because as I explained, these ones will generate the highest information gain anyways. Okay, so the next few slides are just summaries. So the same, we have the same input and uh, what we want is every time we m maximize the information gain and we pick a feature that maximizes that information gain and then and then we split according to that feature. So I summarized the two formulas that you need to calculate the information gain and I wrote it instead of saying fractions, I I, I used the number of y that's equal to a particular y. So say, suppose y is 0, 1, then there are only two, two terms in the sum, and that's just a fraction of class 0 instances or class 1 instances. So this is basically the notation py, and this is also py. And, and since I'm using the counts, there are are some values that are canceled out. So the formula is a bit simpler here. Instead of having like multiple sum and stuff between the sum, I simplify the formula so you can use this formula instead of the formula that I gave before. And again, as I said, find the most informative feature and then split into subsets. And for each one of these subsets, I would build a subtree and then we would continue. And there are many ways to stop. And w one way here is we would just stop until uh, everything in the subset have the same label, then we stop there. <laughs>